Well, welcome. Um, another beautiful evening and another good turnout. That's great. And I think uh, you're all in for a real treat tonight. So I'm, I'm Peter Kern, the uh, director of the Global Public Health Program and uh, the sort of coordinator for this lecture series. And it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, who is Mark Shaleen. Mark is a family medicine doctor in Livingston, Montana. And Mark has the honor of being the person who came the furthest uh, in this whole lecture series to give a lecture tonight. And uh, I'd just like you all to know that this is all on a volunteer, totally volunteer basis. Uh, so we really appreciate his willingness to come all the way to Western Montana uh, to speak to us tonight. Um, Mark um, was born and raised in Denver, and he attended the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Now, I have to stop for a minute here and say that I didn't try to stack the program with the University of Colorado graduates, <laughs> but it turns out that there are three of us. Um, uh, I'm one, Mark's the other, and we'll meet the third before the lecture series is over, so three of us. After that, he went into family medicine residency at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. Fulfilling a childhood dream, he moved to Montana with the Indian Health Service at Crow Agency. This was followed by work at Community Health Center in Billings. And then, love struck a short exodus to Eastern Oregon and private practice before returning um, to settle in Livingston. He's worked at Community Health Partners, a community health center in Livingston for the past 13 years. If any of you were here last year, you might remember that his wife, Genevieve Reed, also a family physician, gave a lecture in last year's series. And she and um, uh, Mark are the proud parents of two boys, Clyde and Gus. As a family, they took a sabbatical in 2010-2011 to live in Bolivia. And there they did work through the nonprofit called Global Midwife Education Foundation, which Genevieve founded and continues to work on and be heavily involved with. That experience is the basis for today's talk. Please join me in welcoming Mark Shalit. Well, thank you. Um, and see, does the microphone, is that about the right volume? Okay. Uh, well, it's great to uh, I guess come back to or to get back over to this side of the state. Uh, I was here uh, just after Christmas, and uh, what a difference a month and a half makes. I was a uh, nail biter with uh, a lot of snow and ice, and uh, this time a lot of brown and uh, a lot of calves on the ground as well. Um, so tonight uh, I'm going to go and I'll show. Basic outline of the talk is uh, going to talk about um, uh, the problem of uh, diarrhea, solutions to that, and sort of in my experience uh, in Bolivia. Um, I hope it will be a pretty informal talk. Uh, if you guys have questions, please raise your hand, interrupt me at any time. I'm going to show you a few pictures too of uh, Bolivia, which is a gorgeous. Uh, in pretty, um, you know, at times, austere uh, country. And this is in the uh, Altiplano. So diarrhea. Who's had diarrhea? <laughs> All right, well, we see people who aren't afraid of the truth. Uh, so very common, I mean, um, you know, a diagnosis is three or more uh, loose stools. Uh, or more than usual for an individual, and you say that for uh, children. Children can have uh, many more than uh, three a day. Uh, 
Um, it's usually the result of an infection, and the um, rotavirus uh, is probably the most important infectious agent out there, co uh, contributing more than 40% of uh, hospital admissions uh, worldwide. How do we get diarrhea? And I call this the F slide. Um, so feces gets into the fluids, gets into water, gets into the fields, into the soil, gets onto flies, and gets onto our fingers. And from there, it gets into, uh, you know, onto our foods and into our mouth or you know, through the water or our fingers into our mouth as well. And so that's the fecal oral uh, transmission route. Um, and this is important. I remember as a uh, student uh, in medical school, I had a, a microbiology uh, professor, and he always loved to quote, uh, the world is covered in a layer of feces. Uh, just the only difference is how, you know, how deep it is. And, uh, and again, this is how it goes from that layer uh, to give us disease. There are three main forms of diarrhea. There's the watery diarrhea, probably what we're used to, uh, rotavirus or cholera. There's the bloody diarrhea, and that's a dysentery, and that's Shigella as an example of that. And then there's a more uh, long-term diarrhea, uh, persistent diarrhea. Uh, cryptosporidium a, um, is a, an example of that. All of those, um, can cause definite health um, uh, uh, impacts. And for us, you know, again, diarrhea tends to be an inconvenience, but it really, it, it kills, and it's a huge problem worldwide. Um, again, I'm just struck by that. Every 20 seconds, a child dies from diarrhea. And what do they die from? The dehydration from the fluid loss, and that's uh, where they would die acutely but it also really increases the risk for pneumonia. And uh, I've read estimates that uh, worldwide, maybe 50% of uh, pneumonias or childhood pneumonias will follow an episode of diarrhea and just the immune system is weakened and uh, puts you at risk for that infection. And then more chronically, it can lead to mal malnutrition and anemia and can get into a real cycle of someone is, um, malnourished and weakened and then get uh, get another episode of diarrhea and their health can just uh, decline. Here's a typical um, uh, house in a compound in the Altiplano. So diarrhea, second leading cause of death among children under age five worldwide. 1.3 million people or children uh, die every year. And again, that's more than the, I call them the sexy three, AIDS, malaria, measles, you could throw in there AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, and those are the ones that you hear, you know, there's a lot of uh, money and uh, I think noise uh, about those. Um, and yet diarrhea kills more kids every year than those three combined. And almost all of them, 88%, are attributed to unsafe water, inadequate hygiene, and poor, or excuse me, inadequate sanitation, poor hygiene. Where's the problem? And you can see red in this slide, it's bad. Um, and you can see it's really in Africa and South Asia. Um, India probably has the largest total number, but those are the, the main uh, problems. Probably if you think back to that quote from my uh, microbiology teacher, that's probably where the uh, layer is the deepest. But then you can see and where my experience was in Bolivia, um, it was a significant issue there as well. Here's an Altiplano town. 
And not everyone dies of diarrhea there. Here's some uh, ancianos, some ancient women. So there is progress. Um, it's uh, diarrhea is preventable and it's treatable. And you can see that we have made some progress uh, through, um, through the, the years. Still more progress to go and um, I can't quote you the, uh, what is the Millennium uh, Development Goal. Yeah, I think it was to uh, decrease diarrhea deaths um, by two, I think it was two thirds um, and from uh, 2000 to 2015, I believe it was. And so the uh, world is not quite on that, uh, is not quite going to make that. I'll touch briefly on treatment because I'm mainly going to focus on prevention. Treatment of diarrhea is really to rehydrate the person. And so there are oral rehydration salts, we call WHO salts, World Health Organization salts. You mix with water and it's a mixture of salt and sugar and that's uh, very effective. You can do that at home and um, will, uh, is a, a, as I said, an effective uh, method to prevent dehydration. Zinc tablets, that'll decrease the uh, volume of diarrhea. Um, and then for those who are uh, especially sick and if you have um, the uh, uh, clinic or a hospital that you can get to, you can do IV fluids. And that's really what we do mainly, or probably you know, home treatment, a lot of people will do uh, oral rehydration. Don't uh, need anything too fancy with that. Uh, but if you get really sick here in the States, you go and you get IV fluids. Prevention, and that's really what we're going to talk about. And so prevention is you know, making sure you have access to uh, safe drinking water, improved, that you use improved sanitation, that you wash your hands with soap, exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life. So you really have to say no to the Nestle's of the world and uh, not use formula. Good personal and food hygiene and then rotavirus vaccination. Um, and again, remember rotavirus is the, uh, is the important, or probably the most important pathogen worldwide. So again, my focus in really, um, the focus of most interventions for uh, prevention of diarrhea is wash, water, sanitation, and hygiene. And again, those address the uh, vast majority of uh, diarrheal deaths, the cause of diarrheal, diarrheal deaths. So water. Safe water, what is safe water? So it's something that you can drink uh, that's not gonna have any short or long-term risks. Something that's safe, um, infectious, so it's, you're not gonna get an infection from it. Uh, there aren't uh, bad chemicals in it, heavy metals or you know, something like arsenic, and that it's not radioactive. Uh, and I think another uh, issue of safe water that I don't have here is um, you know, is it close by? Do you have to go and are you at risk? Uh, you certainly hear about it in Africa where women are usually the ones who go out to get the water, women and children, and they you know, put themselves or they are at risk if they have to travel long distances to, uh, to get their water. Um, most people have uh, an improved drinking water source, even a pipe to their premises. I'll say just because they have that, uh, you know, most places are not. That doesn't necessarily equate to, to be uh, completely safe water. I know that we are in a town of uh, 20 or 20,000 in Bolivia. They had, you know, we had running water to our house. Many times it was interrupted, but, uh, you know, we, uh, naively we were drinking it because everyone else was drinking it uh, until we were coming uh, back in a, uh, uh, in a 
a car with a bunch of folks from the Ministry of Health and found out that we were the only ones drinking that water. Uh, and so we ended up getting bottled water and we had uh, quite a bit less uh, intestinal problems from then on. Um, but you can see that a huge majority, you know, a huge number of people still use uh, surface water and again, uh, even more uh, you know, use water that's uh, contaminated and so you're gonna get sick. Sanitation, so sanitation is safe disposal of human poop. Improved sanitation is one that separates the, the poop from human contact. And examples of that are what we know, so flush toilet, you have a sewer system or a septic system. Um, another one, and the one that we used um, was a flush or a poor flush uh, toilet uh, in a, to a pit latrine. Um, so that's not a basic latrine, that's not a, um, a bucket toilet, that's a, not a lot of different uh, things. It's one that really keeps that uh, the, uh, the poop separate, so you don't, not, you don't have to come into contact with it. So this house doesn't have it. Nor do two and a half billion people. So again, I find that just staggering. Um, and here's a, uh, another uh, a statistic that I find just, uh, again, pretty staggering. One out of seven. Actually, this is better at uh, getting ready for this uh, talk. Before, I used to quote one out of five, but uh, we've made progress. So it's one out of seven people still uh, just poop out in the open. Most of that occurs in uh, rural areas. Certainly where we were in the rural Bolivia, uh, you know, it was you know, just about everyone uh, just pooped out in the open. And here's a cartoon that really shows that, uh, you know, the world, in the world, uh, more people have cell phones than have toilets. And this one, and this one is uh, in particular to India. But uh, again, I think uh, if it's just something that we don't uh, in the U.S. Uh, just don't think about. Hygiene. So hygiene again is something uh, that we perform to uh, preserve our health. Really here we're speaking about just washing your hands at three critical points during the day. So after going to the bathroom, after cleaning a child's bottom, and before handling food. And that's cleaning your hands with soap, because soap really will dislodge the soil and grease on which the uh, germs uh, ad adhere to. So again, the, the F slide, so the fecal oral transmission route. So this is how safe water breaks that transmission. So again, uh, you don't get uh, you know, the, the drinking water, you don't get uh, infected by it, the water doesn't get on the food. You can decrease diarrhea by, they estimate, 47%. Improve sanitation. So there you prevent the feces from getting into the water, the fields, or the flies. 36% decrease. Uh, and then hygiene, you prevent the feces from getting onto your fingers and then to the food or your mouth. And that's a 40% reduction. I don't have a slide just to show that these are all very cost effective, range somewhere between you know, four to eight dollars uh, return on every dollar invested. So just a quick summary on, um, uh, on diarrhea. So again, it's the uh, second leading cause of children under the age of five. Unsafe water, inadequate uh, sanitation, and poor hygiene 
uh, or contribute uh, to the majority of the deaths, and that uh, wash, uh, water, sanitation, and hygiene interventions can break that cycle. So that's just sort of, uh, I think, the background for my talk. You guys have questions? Are there any questions on that? Yes. One thing that I, I've never been able to understand, um, why simple means of uh, disposal of feces, such as outhouses, are so rare. Uh, I traveled and I was there a couple of times. And I was just blown away. There's no place to go. Or uh, if there is a toilet, there's rarely a Wash basin and even less so uh, soap. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it just, it, it's, a, it's like these guys never think of it or something. And I was just curious what your observations were. Uh, you're right that they're, you know, we're used to being able to go, you know, having toilets everywhere and they're just, there aren't toilets there around and you know I think that uh, that's for a number you know can be for a number of reasons some of it is uh, you know many places may not have uh, the sewer connections um, you know I know that outhouses I've certainly talked to a lot of people about them and you know they uh, there's a lot of you know they don't like the smell or the flies associated with an outhouse um, and um, and yeah, and I'm, I can't speak to why there's, uh, you know, not soap um, or wash basins. But in my experience, it's very similar to, uh, to you. It's just, uh, it's not out there. I don't know, other people's experience? What about cost? Oh, sure. No, cost is a huge, huge barrier. Yeah. Among your three solutions, um, which one is the most cost so they talk about that, that hygiene is uh, the most cost-effective uh, intervention because that really will be just, um, you know, doing some education and then you uh, need to provide some soap. Uh, the issue with that is um, really maybe a couple issues. One, you need to have a source of running water. Uh, clean water, otherwise you're just going to recontaminate yourself. Um, two, uh, behavior change is very difficult. I mean, I, I deal with people every single day and hoping to make some behavior, you know, help them make some behavior changes. It's very hard. We think of ourselves, it can be hard to change behaviors. And so um, that, uh, that can be tough. But that is... Uh, that's the most cost effective. Yeah. Other questions or comments? So, um, so sort of the, <clears throat> My experience, the next part, I'll just talk about my experience in uh, Bolivia. Um, so I married this wonderful woman, Genevieve Reed, who's also a family physician, and she is a go-getter, um, drags me along with her. Um, and she went, and for a long, she's had a dream for a long time, and really, with a lot of effort, uh, made that a reality, put together this, uh, this, uh, Nonprofit Global Midwife Education Foundation um, to really to uh, to decrease uh, maternal and infant mortality, um, and with that we raised some money. Uh, we saved up a lot of money and were able to take a year off to go down to Bolivia um, and um, you know sort of well, and do some good good work down there. Um, and so that was in 2010-2011. Here's uh, here I am and Jen and our two boys uh, getting ready to jump on a train down to to Pisa. And I'll just do a quick review of Bolivia, so South America, landlocked country. 
um, three times the size of Montana, varied uh, topography, climates, about 10,000. They speak Spanish. And in the area that we were, quite a bit of Quechua. Um, democracy, now I sort of joke, pseudo-democracy, because uh, President uh, Morales uh, changed the Constitution. So instead of just uh, two limits, he can have, uh, I think, as many uh, terms as he uh, wishes. Um, mining, ag, and services, very poor. Um, and life expectancy is, uh, is not great, and that's a hard life. Uh, really three distinct areas of Bolivia. Over here we have the jungle, sort of in the middle strip you have Andes, and then here you have the Altiplano of the High Plain. And we were in the southwestern part <clears throat> in the uh, Altiplano, and just sort of on the edge of the Altiplano. Um, and uh, Tupisa is where we were. And again, uh, Here's that the Potosi, the, the big region, and that Tupisa right here. And we ended up picking that is because uh, Jen looked on a uh, World Health Organization map and uh, where's, what has the highest maternal uh, mortality. And this lit up red. Um, and then we looked at uh, it. It was um, really she just picked in that it oh, looks like two piece, so that might be the spot. Went down there uh, cold and checked it out on a quick trip down there and said, yeah, this is great. Uh, met some folks who said, yes, come down. We'd be interested in having you. And as far as our kids were concerned, uh, it was high. We were about 10,000 feet, uh, so, and it was dry. So you didn't have uh, malaria uh, there, which was important for us. Are important. Uh, we didn't want to expose our kids to that, um, and so everything was there. The need was there, and it uh, is Spanish-speaking, um, and uh, it's relative, you know, uh, safe for our kids. So the town of Tupisa, about 20,000, uh, 10,000 feet, and was a uh, regional center um, for ag mining, and there was some tourism there as well. Put our boys into school. They really enjoyed that. And then we got down to work. And this was, uh, so this is my wife, Jen, and that's uh, Dr. Willie. And he was the uh, head of the Ministry of Health, the Regional Ministry of Health. Um, and he was uh, really instrumental. He was uh, supportive of, of us. Um, uh, and really, uh, we had a great partnership, worked together well with him. He has a tough, tough job, a uh, big region, um, and they uh, care for, I mean, it's a huge, vast region, uh, and uh, they, have, they have like a ham radio that they talk to. Uh, there's, no, you know, there's no cell phones uh, outside of the uh, city. Um, very difficult just to communicate. Uh, the road system is very, uh, you know, it's inadequate. Uh, bad dirt roads that uh, many times are impassable. Um, so we trained uh, a lot of midwives. And here are some uh, parteras, our traditional uh, birth attendants. Here are some more. And this is Jen training those. And we supplied them, supplied them with some basics. And really, it was like you know, how to uh, prevent infection, and bleeding, um, those are sort of two of the big things that we wanted to uh, address. And there she is with her uh, first uh, group of uh, parteras that she, uh, she trained. Um, when we were getting ready to go down there, in addition to you know, training midwives, we I don't know, it sort of stumbled across this page, this paper, and that's the one that uh, there's a link to, I think, on the, uh, uh, in your papers. Um, and this was really, this was uh, really influenced us, and it's, uh, so again, the Forgotten Foundations of Health. 
Um, and it really just said, you know, laid out the, the facts that, again, uh, diarrhea is just a huge issue. Water, sanitation, hygiene are uh, cost effective uh, and very, you know, cost effective interventions um, to improve uh, people's health. And it's like, why help a baby, um, you know, be safely born into a world and it's just going to die of diarrhea? So um, we really went down. We didn't know exactly what we were going to do um, initially and naively. Oh, I'll help dig the latrines. Uh, didn't really know what we were going to do. But then we went and we talked with Dr. Willie uh, and with the uh, health department and ended up coming um, up with uh, our first bathroom project. And here, excuse me, I. I think I have uh, my slides are not in the order that I'd like them to be. Um, and so this is what we came up with. We really uh, just adapted a uh, design that they already had, that the government of uh, Bolivia had already put together. Um, and as a basic, um, and we modified it a little bit. So a little house. Um, with an initially their initial design was a uh, poor flush toilet, so a little um, hole that you would use a bucket and dump uh, dump water down. Um, but uh, really talking with uh, folks, people you know people want toilets. They want they've watched movies, they've been around, and that's what they uh, they would like that. Uh, and so we are going to do a toilet. But we also wanted to put in um, the lavamanos, the sink, so they could wash their hands. And uh, then this would go to a um, pit latrine uh, that was two and a half meters deep and over a meter wide. And that was calculated to be large enough to hold um, enough uh, or to hold uh, two years of, uh, of uh, 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 poop for uh, an average family of uh, six. And there was uh, some calculations that we uh, looked, uh, looked at that, or that we had uh, came up with that. And here's the uh, plan again. Um, so you can see the toilet, the sink, and then we'd come out here, and this was going to be a permanent solution. That was the beauty of it, uh, the two holes. So you would go, you would have uh, here, you would block one of your tubes. And so for two years, everything would go to this hole, and or that pit, it would fill up um, at the end. So it would at least take at least two years. Uh, once that was full, then you would go and you would unstop this, stop that up, you'd use this pit. And uh, in the two years that it would take to fill that pit, this would dry out and it would be safe um, to handle. And so you could go, you'd dig that out, and if you wanted to, if it was acceptable to the people, they could put it on their fields as uh, bono or um, fertilizer. Uh, if it wasn't acceptable, you could just put it out into the environment and it wasn't going to be um, an infectious problem. And so you just could do swap every two years. And so permanent solution. And so that's how you could do um, uh, you know, an improved uh, sanitation facility without a, uh, a septic system or a, um, or a sewer. So we, um, again, meeting with the uh, Ministry of Health, uh, came up with um, uh, the, our first project, and that was in uh, Carissa. And that was a town that uh, three years before this had put in an application for the government to get bathrooms. Um, and that had not come through, had not come through, and was never going to come through. And so we really were able to team up with the Ministry of Health and to make, you know, to help make this happen. Um, and Carissa was a town of about 60 families. It was um, 
you know, it's ag uh, town. They grew a lot of garlic, a lot of potatoes, uh, and just like everyone in this part of the uh, country, uh, had a lot of goats. Um, it was nice here is uh, Adrian. Uh, we knew Adrian because he was in our one of our uh, or in our first class of uh, parteros, uh, and he was one of the team or town leaders. Um, and he was really he would turn he. Uh, he was the uh, project uh, leader for this town. Here are some of the uh, hard-working men of Carissa, harder-working women. Uh, and what we came, what we really spent quite a bit of time with, uh, uh, with the Ministry of Health is coming up with a convenio or an agreement uh, contract. Um, and laid out uh, everyone's responsibilities. And so this was going to be, you know, in collaboration, a shared uh, project. And so uh, Global Midwife, we were going to uh, supply the materials. The community, uh, they were going to um, help with uh, transporting the materials and also they would they were going to be the ones who were going to do the work and build the the bathrooms and then the uh health um, department uh they were going to be involved they would do some super uh, they would do supervision and uh instruction and so that we are three partners in this here they laid out just exactly uh what we were going to supply and what uh, everyone else was going to do. And so you can see we shopped around and he ended up with some cement and, uh, you know, a bath. There, the, let's see, the toilet is the Inodoro. And that was the most expensive. No, no, so the cement was the most, uh, was the biggest expense. Uh, followed by the uh, Inodoro, the bath, uh, excuse me, the toilet, and then uh, the roof was the uh, third most expensive. Uh, at this time, it was about, I think it was seven uh, Bolivianos to the dollar, so it was about $150, $140 for a, uh, for a bathroom. Um, so that's what we would supply to each family. Uh, the families were responsible for, again, doing the, all the work. It would be uh, six days of work on average to build, uh, to, to build your uh, bathroom, full days. Uh, every person had uh, a nominal, uh, well, not so nominal, $10, that's not a nominal. Um, uh, uh, they would have to supply some supplies. Um, and then the uh, Ministry of Health was going to go, they would supervise, uh, verif uh, help us verify that things were moving along, and then most importantly afterwards would uh, instruct folks in hygiene and then uh, also maintenance. I mean, you don't think about it, but yeah, you got to keep your bathroom clean. How do we learn that? We learn that from our parents. Uh, if you've never had to do that before, you have to learn it from, you, know, you have to be taught by someone. And so they were, uh, that was uh, a part of what uh, the Ministry of Health would do. Um, I think they set out a time frame and then he had lots of room, a uh, page for all the stamps. Uh, Bolivia, South Americans, Bolivians in particular, love their stamps. So we had to have a stamp. Everyone would have a stamp, and then the next page would be every family would go and would sign, uh, would sign this. And so, uh, really, what we wanted was everyone in the community was um, going to build a bathroom. It didn't help if just 50% of the people uh, had bathrooms, and that still meant 50% of the people were just pooping out in the open. And so that was our um, basic contract and then we can, we'd come up uh, and this was our um, uh, our construction uh, chronogram so first we'd go we'd sign the convenio 
uh, then first phase construction of the, uh, the pits uh, and then you'd go and you'd inspect, make sure that everyone had their pit, make sure it was big enough. Um, and then uh, second phase, you built the uh, house um, and a few other things. Uh, and then you get, make sure that was inspected. And if you uh, completed that, then you got the materials to go on to the third phase. And that was the bath. Uh, you get the toilet um, and the uh, sink. Uh, then make sure that that was done, and then the fourth phase um, was the instruction phase. And so that was sort of our basic template. Um, we'd really, uh, you know, the the community could come up with whatever time frame fit them. You always had to work around planting, harvest, uh, carnival. There are lots of different things you had to work around. So we go out, and here's uh, Ilarion, uh, one of the uh, employees of the uh, Ministry of Health, the uh, uh, sanitarian, uh, presenting to the uh, uh, to the people of Carissa. We show them the uh, uh, the plans. Once a little f further along, Ilarion got uh, quite a bit more. Oh, uh, I mean, came up in, uh, with this uh, great model, and I think that really helped uh, people to visualize and uh, help see what, the, what they were going to uh, build. Then there was uh, the signing, uh, where again, everyone would uh, sign up, we would get a set of the plans, and then uh, later, at a n later date, then we would go back and with uh, Ministry of you know health uh, folks would go. Uh, the uh, homeowner would decide where on their compound they would like the uh, their bathroom to be, and measure it. There they go right to work. Here's a this guy was great, 70 years old. He was the first person to get his uh, pit dug. Here's a guy, I love this picture, big chew of, uh, big wad of coca. Uh, he is lining his pit with uh, rocks. Here we are checking. Um, and gentlemen, he's again finished his uh, pit. He's made the tops. Um, and that'll go, that'll cover the pits. Here's another guy, so they're building their uh, little house. Here's one that's completed. You can see the other one was Adobe. This one, these guys had more resources. Uh, they did uh, nice blocks. You can see here, here's that uh, camera, the distribution. Um, and these would be the two, uh, the pits. And I think, yeah, that's, that's another one out of Adobe. Here's another one out of different blocks, and you can see the uh, tubing coming out that would go to the uh, pits. Um, here's the divider plugged with, uh, I don't know if that shows up, but uh, that's a liter uh, you know, Coke bottle. Another pit. Little girl who will benefit. That's goat drying on a rack. And here's another nice, I think this is a nice picture again, shows uh, a nice uh, house, tubing coming out here. Again, you'd plug one uh, hole, so you'd use this pit for, until it was full, at least two years, and you could swap and use the other pit. There was the uh, sink. Could the sink right into the pit? It, it could either or. Some people did it just to the ground, and other folks would do it into the pit. Everyone did, I mean, it's amazing. These guys build their own houses, and they did their own work. And this was, uh, you know, they did 
great work. I didn't uh, sh bring uh, photos of all, I mean, I could bore you to death with all the bathroom photos that we took, but people really did some great work. You could see these folks lined it with, uh, they put some tile in. And here's a picture that sort of warms my heart. It really shows a uh, toilet with, in Bolivia, they don't uh, flush their um, toilet paper down. Um, it is, uh, you know, they save it and burn it. Um, and so this is a toilet that's uh, being used. So, so that was uh, a very, you know, we went and did that in Carissa. That was our first project, and that was very successful. People uh, it completed their toilets, um, and it was nice. I just went back uh, for the first time this fall, so uh, over two years since I left, and uh, went and visited Carissa, and everyone is still using their toilet. Uh, some people were not uh, using the sink. Uh, some people, that $10, uh, they were getting some uh, tubing, some of, those, uh, some of this type tubing, um, or maybe tubing that went to connect to their existing water and some people had not connected that, and so we're using, you saw bathrooms that were just beautifully constructed, uh, and there was the uh, a can of water, and they would use uh, water to do the pour flush in their, uh, down their toilet instead of uh, having hooked up. Um, so that was a little disappointing, but they were still using it as a poor flush uh, latrine. But really, it was nice. Everyone was, uh, and really, all those uh, toilets were being used. What um, percentage of the community so <coughs> everyone, so all the families uh, uh, built their toilets. Some people, so it was really in this community, 100%. And that's what we really would shoot for. We did do other communities uh, where it was not quite 100%, but it was in the high 90s. Um, and that's, uh, we really wanted 100%. So everyone would build their uh, own um, uh, bathroom. Again, it'd be six full days, uh, including, you know, a day each for, uh, dig in their uh, their pits and then to build the house and whatnot. Um, and some people, some of the maybe the older folks uh, would hire would hire out um, as well. But so that, this was 100%. Uh, um, we have since replicated this, uh, and I think we're up to about 27 communities that we've done it in, and. We've refined, uh, I mean, you learn as you go. Uh, one of the things we really learned was you need someone like Adrian, someone in the community who's really going to be the community project leader um, to uh, coordinate uh, things, to uh, keep folks on task. Um, you really need a community that is, uh, that, uh, is cohesive and is functional. And we found that many communities there uh, were not uh, and couldn't get it together um, to even get a, um, a proposal into us. And so that was, I guess, maybe I should step back. Uh, we would go, and after this first, um, first experience, uh, word got out in the communities and you know, people were interested in getting this, so we had lots of proposals. Uh, so it, the communities would come to us with a proposal, yes, would like, uh, uh, bathrooms, uh, the community needed to have uh, water to each household because again these uh, were individual family uh, bathrooms um, so you had to have water to each individual house and not even though the government said that every community has water uh, it wasn't quite what we found um, so a community needed water needed to be, to sort of have their act together, be able to uh, give us a good proposal, tell us who um, lived in the community. There was always a little bit of uh, uh, going back and forth who actually lives in the community, who uh, has a house there but has crossed over and now is in Argentina uh, picking fruit, comes back just on occasion. Um, 
Uh, so we'd have to uh, see who was uh, there. And then, um, and then as we said, you yeah, needed a good uh, community leader. Uh, and then a functional uh, district uh, uh, government, because uh, many of the uh, outlying communities, it was quite one of the big costs of the community was the transportation of all the goods. Those are a lot of goods that are heavy. Uh, you need to have a truck, which each community would have, but the, the gas to get it there. Um, and some communities, uh, they're all Chaldea, they wouldn't uh, come together and pay for them. Uh, and so that was, uh, that was an issue to get the materials there. Um, but, um, and then we really wanted, we strove for 100% participation. Um, you can't make someone do something that they don't want to do. But uh, really, with uh, community pressure, um, we'd really get to close to 100% in each community. Um, uh, other questions or comments? Let's quickly, we talk about water. We did do um, uh, a couple water projects down there. And again, every community, uh, the government was said, you know, every community has electricity and water. Uh, and every community does have electricity. Many of the really outlined ones, it's solar. Um, and most communities had water. Uh, some of them, uh, their water systems had, excuse me, had broken. Um, and uh, so they were just collecting water out of the river. Here was a community, Tambio Alto, that we did. Uh, our first, uh, we'll call it a water project. They're right on the uh, uh, river, El Rio Tupisa. Um, and you can see here, this is a typical setup for uh, a Bolivian community. It would have a well, and that well would pump water up to a big cistern, and then it would gravity fed to each house. And here in this community, that was what they had pretty fancy uh, spigot. But unfortunately, this community, that spigot was dry because their pump had uh, broken um, two years before. And they uh, had never gotten around to fixing it. So for two years, they, even though they had everything in place, they still just went and they collected the river water. That's what they used. Um, and so we went, uh, uh, really, again, here's uh, Don Hilarion with the uh, sanitation um, department. He knew this uh, community, and uh, they came and um, approached us uh, to see if we could help them solve their problem. With uh, really a f some phone calls and a little elbow grease, we found that you could send that uh, their pump up to the Paz, and for $500, we got that uh, pump fixed. Um, the community went and uh, put together during the two years, some of the, a lot of the cable had disappeared. Community replaced that, and then the Ministry of Health uh, got together. There's a local, um, oh, uh, engineering school in Tupisa, uh, and they were going to give them uh, the, uh, they would install the pump and uh, instruct the uh, community on how to uh, use that. So that was one of our water projects. Here's another one, and this is a community of Rio Mahone, very, uh, uh, it's way out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, they had solar for their electricity. They had a pump uh, excuse me, they had a well that uh, had gone dry, so the government had come and drilled another well for them, though, but it was, the problem was it was a half mile from their old well, and so they needed a uh, half mile of tubing um, to hook into their existing, um, existing uh, system. And so we went, they approached us, we went in about for $1,000, bought the tubing, and then that community went and dug, uh, you know, um, w uh, dug the ditch and uh, installed the uh, tubing there. 
all by hand. Um, so those are two examples of uh, water projects. And again, you know, that would give you access to water. I can't speak that it was uh, particularly or necessarily safe water. Um, none of the water, even in two pieces of the town at 20,000, was treated. Um, and, uh, and then another uh, issue for the water in this region was that uh, there's a lot of mining there, and so there's a lot, a lot of heavy metals, uh, and lead, arsenic. Um, so uh, this is a picture. This is uh, Francisca. She's uh, our employee down in uh, Tupisa, and she's the one who's really oversees our projects there. Um, she helps coordinate the trainings and also really oversees the bathroom projects. Um, she's great. Uh, she speaks Quechua. Here's a selfie of my wife and uh, Francisca. They're in the uh, truck coming back from uh, one of their trainings. And here, Francisca's out on a job inspecting the whole, you know, the uh, pozos, the, the pits. Uh, and again, key for uh, uh, us, I mean, she's honest, she is frugal, and uh, she's, uh, she is, uh, she keeps you in line. She's a hard driver, and she speaks Quechua. And so in many of these outlying towns, uh, that is the, uh, that's their primary language. Here are some uh, of the hardworking uh, Ministry of Health uh, folks, and this is a typical scene. Uh, here they are around a broken, uh, broken down uh, truck. The transportation is a huge issue um, in uh, Bolivia, certainly with the Ministry of Health, and we really found that that was one of our limiting factors. It's hard to uh, go out to. Uh, more remote areas to do either trainings or to uh, to oversee these uh, bathroom projects, and uh, so last year uh, we raised money to uh, buy a truck um, that um, again more the Ministry of Health folks, and here it is, a GMEF uh, and. Uh, Ministry of Health uh, truck, uh, and so it's really to be used uh, to help go uh, oversee um, uh, our projects. Um, and we have many more projects. There's Francisca riding off into the sunset. Uh, so more bathroom projects. I mean, there are many more. As I said, we've done, I think here I list uh, what we've done so far. We've trained 150 parteros. Uh, trained and supplied, uh, 27 communities, uh, over 700 uh, individual bathrooms built, and uh, four communities with water projects. Here we are, and that's not snow, that's salt. That's the Salar de Uyuni, largest salt plant in the world. And here are a few lessons that I, I took away from uh, our time over there. One is to do good deeds, uh, particularly in, uh, you know, in health. You don't need to be a doctor. I think certainly we did much more. Uh, uh, I think we tried to do much more addressing the basic needs of folks uh, and um, you know, certainly did not need to be a the MD for that. Uh, second was the relationships. I think it really helped that we were there for a year. Um, we had our kids. Uh, you really get uh, any, uh, relationships are key, uh, credibility that you uh, were there. And, uh, and then I think they've seen enough folks sort of come and go. Um, uh, certainly in Bolivia, they've seen lots of folks come in say it could be promised one thing and then uh, it's not delivered and so i think it was nice that uh, we were there for a while and, and we're still there my wife still goes back twice a year flexibility wow you got to be flexible if you're doing uh, international um, 
work and you think you're going to do one thing and uh, you quickly find you're doing something else um, and uh, and then sort of our mantra was it was easy it had already been done uh, and that would keep us going during some of our uh, more uh, our darker days and I love this slide this is my favorite uh, uh, our, my f I guess favorite sign uh, down in Tupisa, Los Obras del Cambio son para que todos vivimos bien. The works of change are so that all of us may live well. So, uh, well, I think that's all I have to you guys. Questions or comments? So we, uh, so specifically bathrooms. So again, we sort of knew wow, we wanted to do something water, sanitation, hygiene-wise. Um, didn't know exactly what. Meeting with the Ministry of Health, they had really identified that here is a community that wanted bathrooms, uh, and so it was, uh, I guess, an easy, uh, easy place for us to start with that community, uh, and then sort of. And it was also easy because the need was there. Really, you know, I think we talked about 90% of the uh, open defecation happens in rural areas. In rural Bolivia, that's 100% of the people just poop out in the open. Um, and so that was it. The other thing I didn't say that we always included schools. All these communities have schools. And so that's we'd always make sure that the schools would uh, get a bathroom as well. I wonder if you'd share a little bit with us on the financing side. Um, it strikes me that when you add up everything that you did, it becomes rather expensive. And, and yeah. the sub-question there is, why did you decide to go with individual bathrooms rather than a community bathroom? Or several community bathrooms. Right. So, um, Two parts. So I'll answer maybe the second part first. So really, uh, uh, for an improved uh, sanitation facility, that's really uh, by definition, uh, at least what I've uh, read, is that really shouldn't be something that is shared. Maybe it's shared between a couple uh, families, but not uh, a community-wide bathroom, uh, because uh, many times then it's who's going to uh, who's going to care for that. Uh, bathroom, um, and uh, it's just not as effective uh, an intervention. Um, so that's why we went with individual bathrooms, and plus that's what the people wanted. Um, but it comes at a cost. It is. It's. I mean, uh, you know, I think $150 uh, doesn't seem like much, but then when you repeat that over and over again, it adds up, and it does. I mean, we, I ask myself all the time, are we using the money as best that we could? Um, and, uh, and I'm not sure of that answer. I think we use it uh, wisely, and I think we're, um, uh, I think, uh, uh, yeah, I think we're using it wisely. Uh, how do we get that money? Uh, a lot of uh, fundraising. Um, so we've approached a lot of, you know, individuals um, and do put on fundraisers and really people have been very uh, generous. Um, and so the, uh, just have done individuals, a few foundations um, and uh, always can use more. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> you said that you went back been over two years have you seen a health increase in yeah so that's what we really love to see it's like uh, and so we do have access to uh, Ministry of Health data the problem with that is it's 
bad data. Uh, and so I can't say, I'd love to be able to say, oh yeah, we've seen a uh, 50% decrease in diarrheal uh, episodes. Um, at this point, we can't say that. And so I think at this point, um, the, all we can say is we know that these are uh, interventions that work. But uh, yeah, we looked at the data and uh, it, you know, maybe it's going to be two more years of data. Um, but uh, yeah, that, so good, good question. We've looked at that. And, and what other questions? Yeah? People that you um, train as midwives, just volunteers? Are they for the Yes, yeah, so they are just volunteers, and so they are f people that have either been, uh, who are, were already doing it, um, or the communities had uh, picked as, you know, um, as the people who are going to care for them, and so, uh, yeah, it's so all volunteer. And so um, my wife would do, she, trainings would be maybe two days. Um, we've done, uh, sort of got the low hanging fruit, uh, communities close to two piece that we did uh, early and then uh, would go out to, you know, distant communities and put on a two day training. Women would walk, you know, some would come a day uh, to get there, some pretty remote. But yeah, I'll volunteer. And you know, again, not fancy interventions, just really things like um, uh, you know, how to wear, you know, wearing gloves, providing a safe or a cleaner spot, other than you know, traditionally in Bolivia, the tradition is to give birth. Um, you know, you're going to be by yourself if you're lucky. You have your mother or your husband, uh, and you do it over a, a goat skin. So not not the best of conditions. No, this has really been very interesting and uh, illuminating. Um, before we conclude, I want to let you know about next week's lecture. Next week we have Michelle Sayer, who's going to be talking about her experiences at uh, Chinook students uh, in uh, Mongolia last summer. Uh, and uh, remember that that's a switch with George Vesey, who will be talking the week after next. Um, I think Mark should probably stay a little bit longer, but he's got a long drive back to Livingston. And if any of you have questions you want to ask him individually, please do so. So thank you once again, Mark.